Good evening, everyone, and thank you for showing up to uh, April's Racial Healing and Reconciliation Talk on behalf of the Jacksonville Urban League Center of Advocacy and Social Justice. I want to say thank you all for showing up for these important conversations to ensure that we are continuously making progress in racial relations in Jacksonville and beyond. Today, we have the amazing Elizabeth Anderson from One Jax who will be speaking today and sharing her insight. And then um, their floor will open up for questions and answers. But again, as we're having this conversation, please be sure to share your input, engage with our speaker, and we'll be sure to engage with you as well. We also have William Malone of the Jacksonville Urban League on, on as well, as well as some of our guests. So welcome. And then I'll just go ahead and pass it over to you, Elizabeth. Great. Thank you so much. My name is Elizabeth Anderson. Um, I am with One Jax. Um, and I'm, I'm here and looking forward to sharing a little bit tonight about not only um, who I am and my background, but a little bit more about what One Jax does. And then really interested to know some feedback from you all that are um, so deeply dedicated to this particular work. Um, more feedback about how One Jax can be better partners. Um, maybe, maybe better is the wrong word, but continue to be a partner um, in healing and reconciliation. So, um, I am a Jacksonville native. I grew up here in Jacksonville and Arlington. I graduated from Terry Parker. Uh, I went away to college, came back and was a teacher here, a public school teacher. I um, actually taught at my alma mater, Terry Parker, um, and then for a little bit over at Ed White. Um, while I finished up my master's in mental health counseling over at UNF. Um, swoop for all of those that are UNF uh, fans. That's right. Um, after finishing up my uh, master's degree, I made the career shift into mental health counseling and spent um, several years in community mental health. So I did um, in-home and in-school therapy for children and families. And I most of my time was spent um, north side, west side, and then um, in the Inglewood area, sort of that south side Inglewood area. So very much um, a wide variety of diverse populations and a, a wide variety of socioeconomic status and needs and behavioral and emotional needs. Um, and going into all the different schools was one of my favorite parts of the, the job, having been a teacher and then going into schools and, and feeling the different cultures, not just, I mean, when you walk into a front office, you can feel um, you know, whether or not a school is warm and inviting just by whether or not you get a greeting. It's like the welcome to Mo's test. Um, and learning about the environments where our young people are growing up, where they're spending their time, the educators that are investing in them, um, that maybe sometimes are writing them off, um, you know, was always something that was really interesting to me. My first, my first uh, job as a therapist was in the EBD program. So we're, I was working with severely uh, emotionally and behaviorally disabled children. Um, and to watch the system move young people through and sometimes, um, you know, put them in sort of discipline situations um, or call for, you know, stronger, more structure and being harder on them. What was really happening were, you know, social and emotional problems that were often a result of uh, intergenerational trauma and structural systems that were really set up against them. Um, so I did that work for a while. And then in 2018, um, a friend of mine said, hey, you should run for school board. And people were talking a lot about mental health um, for our children. And I thought, well, I'll, I'll throw my hat in the ring, but mostly I just want to talk about mental health for children. And um, so ran for school board district two, that was 2018. Apparently other people really wanted to talk about that too. So I was elected and honored to serve a term on the Duval County school board. Um, now, I don't know if you know much about 
what happened in the years between 2018 and 2022. Um, but that was a very challenging time to be on a school board. Um, but I'm so proud of some of the work that we were able to accomplish. Um, so we were able to pass two referendum. Um, one of those is the half penny sales tax, where we were able to put together a master facilities plan that what the intention was to be able to take care of some of the schools um, that had been neglected for a long time. Um, I represented the beaches area and, and East Arlington. And so it was really important to me that the way that the funds were distributed was equitable, that we were able to give um, the appropriate uh, distribution of those tax dollars to the places that needed it the most. And for better or worse, that just wasn't many of the schools that I was representing. And so it was important to me to have a vote, to have a voice and to share those dollars um, in places where historically neighborhoods had been left behind. Um, also during my chairmanship on the school board, we renamed the six schools that had been named after Confederate leaders. I'm really proud of that work. It was very challenging um, time for our school board, very challenging school board meetings to have folks come and, and to learn that what we thought was part of history was not. You know, there were there are people coming to our school board meetings that were very clearly still engaged in white supremacist activities and committed to the lost cause of the Civil War. And so that was it was something that while it was frustrating, um, I felt like it was really important for our community and neighbors to see that this this is not gone away in the way that maybe some of us wanted to believe it had. Um, of course, we went through COVID 2022 was a really ugly and difficult election season. Um, and so after leaving the school board in 2022, I took some time I went back to uh, my private practice and mental health and, and did some consulting. But I knew that community service and public service was still really at the heart of um, where I felt I needed to be in this community in Jacksonville. Um, and so when the opportunity to lead One Jacks came along this past fall, um, I was really excited to throw my hat in the ring. And so um, just really about six, no, no, eight weeks ago now, um, I stepped into the role of CEO over at One Jacks um, and I couldn't be more thrilled. I, I'm going to assume, and you can, if you have emojis or reactions and you want to give those, um, I'm going to go with the assumption that most people are less familiar with One Jacks. And there's probably a good reason for that. Um, because the last 10 years or so, um, One Jacks has been an institute of UNF. So just like um, the other centers, the women's centers and the LGBTQ centers, One Jacks was housed on the UNF campus. Um, that's not where we've always been. We're actually a 54 year old organization um, that got our roots as the local NCCJ. That was the National Conference for Christians and Jews um, 54 years ago when the, the conversation was um, about um, racial understanding, racial reckoning and healing, excuse me, not racial, religious, faith, interfaith. Um, and so we've seen obviously the evolution of um, social justice and human rights issues come full circle many times over the decades and generations. Um, One Jacks, the NCCJ, excuse me, became um, the National Coalition for Just Communities, Communities and Justice, NCCJ, National Coalition for Communities and Justice. Um, and that's still part of the uh, work that we do with One Jacks. We are a social justice organization at the heart of what we do. But because of our roots um, between Christians and Jewish faith, um, faith leaders and communities, we still have a pretty big foothold in the interfaith space. And, and there is a commitment to interfaith work, but that's just one pillar of the work that we do. Um, when we went to UNF, um, the, the diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging work that, that One Jacks was doing both with our interfaith leaders, with the community, with our youth programs, um, became so contentious because of the DEI legislation that we know that has, has passed over the last couple of years um, that prevents our public school system from spending any money on diversity, equity, or inclusion um, services 
uh, we needed to leave the UNF campus. And so now recently we've seen that the Women's Center has closed and um, the Jewish, you know, the Student Center, the Interfaith Center has closed, the LGBTQ Center has closed, all of the centers that um, provide for young people, for students with various identities um, are no longer being able to be served by public tax dollars on university campuses. And one Jax was one of those that um, I'll say fell prey to that legislation. So now one Jax is back and um, really community facing. And I am thrilled to be able to take over um, the organization in this moment, because I think we've got a lot of work to do and a lot of opportunity to come back and introduce ourselves again to the community. Um, people know us for things like the Humanitarian Awards, for example. May 9th will be our annual Humanitarian Awards that we um, that we sponsor every year. We also have at Thanksgiving time a gratitude service with all of our interfaith leaders. And then every summer we host camps for middle and high schoolers through our One Youth program that focuses exclusively on diversity, inclusion, and belonging, and building a culture of connection between those young people and their community. So there's not just one thing that we do, we do lots of things, um, but one of the things that I am learning is a really great asset for the organization is the interfaith dialogues and the interfaith work that we do with our faith leaders. I say that it's an asset, but I'll tell you that I think it could be better. And one of my missions, one of my goals as, as I move into this role and we look at what is the mission of One Jacks, how can we tailor um, or maybe even revision um, what One Jacks can be in this community, I think it's bringing more diversity to the table, bringing more voices to the table. Unfortunately, over the years, we've started just talking to ourselves. Um, we've got sort of the same, it look, if you take a picture, everybody kind of looks the same. They're kind of of the same generation. They probably came from similar neighborhoods. Um, and we really need to work on broadening that, um, that work that we do. And I know that we are not doing our community any favors um, by talking to ourselves. And so I, I am looking forward to um, having dialogue with you all. It looks like we're a nice small group, um, but I'd like to hear from you all the work, how our work, how One Jacks and the work that we do can help um, really reach out and do a better job specifically in, uh, in our black communities and, and making sure that we have what we, that we're practicing what we preach, that we have diverse voices at the table informing the work that we do. Um, we have a, a long history and tradition of civil discourse in our organization. And so we, we are, enjoy coming together and bringing people with different and varying perspectives to have hard conversations and modeling for the community, how to do that with respect um, and understanding, sometimes agreeing to disagree, um, but that we shouldn't shy away from difficult subjects. And I think race, reconciliation, healing, those are things that I see One Jacks really being able to sit at the table on and help broaden the community that, that um, is willing and interested to be invested in this work specifically and including um, faith leaders that might not come to this table all the time. So um, I would be happy to show you our website, but more than that, I really wanna hear from you all and answer any questions that you have. Um, and maybe through that, we can uh, take a look at more about what OneJax does and how we can be a better part of the conversation because I just don't think our community as a whole is doing a good enough job bringing everyone to the table for this discussion. We're, we are continuing to work in silos, having done community ad advocacy work. You know, the people that care about this are talking to each other. I, I you know, the, the weekend events that I go to and table at these are all my friends, right? And we say hi, and, and every now and then we get more community folks in. Um, but I wish that we were doing better um, job crossing, uh, the, I guess, the intersection of paths of our various organizations. I see here in the chat, let me look at it really quick. I saw something come up. 
What's my community outreach plan? I think that's great. One of the things that we do is community suppers. Um, community suppers has been happening for several years now, but um, in fairness, it really hasn't had a community outreach plan. So one of the things that I think we should be doing is being more intentional with reaching out to groups like the Urban League um, and inviting folks to the to the suppers. Um, and not just us going to the suppers, but having an opportunity to say, hey, what are you guys doing? What are you hosting and how can we come to you? Um, right now in, in the work that I'm doing as a new CEO, I call it my 90 day world tour. Um, I am out and learning from people what they are doing and how we can be better partners. Um, so that's, that's the community outreach so far um, is making introductions and learning more about how we can engage. Yeah, we network with a lot of organizations. So um, in fact, one of the events coming up that is really great that I definitely wanna make sure to share with you all, but I can do that now um, since we're talking about networking with organizations is a partnership that we have um, for an event commemorating the 70th anniversary of Brown versus Board of Education. So on April 16th, we are partnering with 90 Forward, ASALA, the NAACP, um, Florida Humanities, Florida Free Press, um, and we'll be hosting a film screening um, that maybe several people saw when it came through here. It was just another bombing, Donald and Iona's story. Um, but then we have an incredible um, list of panelists that will have panel discussion and Q&A following that. So we'll be hosting um, Warren Jones from our school board, uh, Cleve Warren, Dr. David Jameson, um, a, a gentleman named Abel Bartley, who's coming from Clemson, who literally wrote the book uh, called The NAACP Struggle to Integrate Duval County Public Schools, um, as well as um, Terry Brown Neal and Tim Gilmore. So the, we are really excited about that partnership. And this is the type of collaboration that I am looking to do more of as I continue on this journey at One Jacks. Because the community doesn't know. Like if we can just talk for a second about because I've been so deep in Brown versus Board of Education. Um, my background as an educator and on the school board, I don't think that the community is very aware. Maybe some of you all are, maybe you're not, but um, you know, Duval County in particular was building segregated schools until the 70s. Um, Brown versus Board of Education was passed by the Supreme Court in 1954. And yet, more than a decade later, we were still building separate schools um, in, in order to avoid integrating. Um, and it wasn't until 1971 that the MIMS case here um, and then WACP had a court order to desegregate our Duval County Public Schools. And in fact, um, oh, Larry Zinke is a gentleman who'll be joining us on the panel as well. Larry Zinke worked for the school district. He's a um, uh, an older white man, but he was responsible for writing the implementation plan to integrate our schools. And that work went on for some time, but in 1989, the court said, nope, you're still not integrated enough. And we continued to remain under that court order desegregation until we met what the court considered unitary status. And um, that court order was, was not vacated until 2001. So for people to, to really understand that that is the world <laughs> that Duval County has lived in, I mean, into this century is, um, is I think really important educational work that I'm, I look forward to engaging in with partners. Thank you for those questions, Stacey. What other organizations have you found to be particularly effective in promoting racial reconcilement and understanding? Um, in in my work with One Jacks or just, uh, just before, since before I was with One Jacks? Um, uh -huh. I guess one that comes to mind, which I know has an event coming up um, it, soon, um, I think on the 15th, um, is eye care. I, you guys have probably met with eye care. Has eye care come and presented for you all? Then I know they're, they're hosting the Nehemiah assembly, I think on the 15th. 
Um, and the reason why I really like I Care, it is a group of faith leaders as well. But when I was on the school board, I would meet with them and we would talk about um, restorative justice practices, sort of these alternative practices for not criminalizing our young people, specifically our Black male students, but our Black female students are very much disproportionately impacted by discipline. Um, and I, I think that they were really great advocates for work that promoted better understanding. I'll, I'll tell you, I remember having, when I first came in, I said, listen, we need to have more training for our staff, cultural competency training. And, and I remember talking to a, a high district administrator who said, well, but Ms. Anderson, the, these children, um, you know, many of them, especially our young black children have black educators. So, you know, they, what kind of cultural training should we be doing? Um, and I just found that to be so surprising because the assumption was that if you were a Black child being taught by a Black educator, then there was no misunderstanding about the needs for that Black child. Um, and it just was, it was just shocking to me. And so I, I think that um, I Care is one of those groups that has been helpful in creating um, conversation um, and highlighting the need for for equity, um, for not necessarily meeting. I mean, I think we I think we all understand, right? That equity is about meeting people um, where they are and giving them what they need, um, even if that is different from the from the person sitting next to them, um, and not making assumptions about what works or doesn't work, uh, especially based on the color of someone's skin. Yes, sir, Mr. Scott. Oh, sorry, is that your job? Sorry. <laughs> okay. Go ahead. Stanley, if you're talking, you're on mute, my friend. Oh. Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, yes. Uh I am impressed uh, uh, with, with your pre presentation. Uh, great job, great job. You're on the right track here. Now, I'm, uh, my concern at this present time is, for some concern in Jacksonville, when it comes talking about making a difference, we're go we're dealing with the same people. I'm talking about they've been in leadership anywhere from ten to twenty years. Mm -hmm. You know. And I know this to be a fact. I'm not talking about something I heard because I'd be in those meetings. So why do you think that that is? Because what? of what you said earlier. They have become comfortable. They are receiving a paycheck, but the heart is not in, into it unless you're talking about uh, Kids Hope Alliance because I meet uh, with them often uh, when they come to the leadership. So they, they understand that is more about the heart than the money. I'm trying to think, you know, as, as one, Jax, this is, this is why I like getting out and having these conversations and coming to you all and hearing your perspectives. One of the, one of the things that we have done historically as an organization is done some of the behind the scenes work. So we have gone in and done mediation with the city, or we have, been able to help um, organizations struggle with how do I navigate this situation? This is this is challenging and helping bring people to the table. Not that we are the experts on all things, but being partners with folks so that we can bring people to the table to have these hard conversations. But it sounds like, you know, I'm I keep thinking about we need to walk this back. When if only it. the same people are willing to talk about this, where are we missing? Where are people afraid to come to this conversation? And how do we walk it back so that we engage people in a place that they are comfortable? I mean... That's new leadership. You need new leadership yeah. across the board. And, 
And I would just like to add to that point, like just to give a little bit of background about myself, I'm currently a doctor of public health student. And just in the past year, and I have an education background, and I actually started teaching early. But um, my first teaching job was right here, like in the same neighborhood when I was 22. So Mm -hmm. like, um, I don't, I don't want to say it's all about me, but like when I do go to uh, meetings with my colleagues and things of that sort, they're kind of held in certain positions. Like, um, yes, I've been afforded uh, education through, you know, equity initiatives and diversity and inclusion in, uh, initiatives. And I'm also a Gates Millennium Scholar. So yes, those things help. But even given like this past year so I also have my master's at this point have done some work but when it comes to like actually trying to be a leader be in place do things like it's just like crickets it is crickets Mm -hmm. from various organizations and like um just for example um I I started I I, I'm I was a product of Head Start like um Mm -hmm. one of the programs that was uh promoted through the health and human uh department of health and human services um, last fall, I actually, uh, I'm at, I'm at FAM, um, Florida A&M University last fall. One of the uh, recruiters was from the Department of Health and Human Services. And I kind of, for some reason, it was just on, on, you know, my chest to give her, you know, hey, like I was, a, uh, you know, I was, I started in one uh, head start and I've benefited from all these different programs because I'm also a ward of the state. So a lot of the a lot of the support that was in my life came from various initiatives. It's like just like a really whole patchwork of like, you know, just things coming together to work out for the good. And then like now I see those things are like being phased out because a lot of the programs like communities and schools, TRIO, all of those programs are have either been reduced in funding or been completely cut out. And now it's just like, okay, well, I'm trying. And then even when I, um, because after, after I taught here, while I was pursuing my master's, I took the time to work in the district of Columbia public schools Mm -hmm. and problems, problems a little, I'm not going to say worse, but there's still a problem there. And then I had the opportunity to actually work on policies. And this was during the time of COVID. So like, you know, they were like, hey, yes, let's get people to the table. Let's do the work. And did the work, volunteered my time, gave my input. We even had students there. We had parents there running focus groups, getting data, doing the work, making sure things are coming together. And then that following fall when I was returned as, you know, we returned back in person the only thing that was changed was grading policies that did not benefit the students. So like it gave the students like, um, they had waiting for submission. We had to input WSs, waiting for submissions will automatically gave the students 63%. So you have students that are, have not submitted anything that are pretty much passing if they do one thing and then have the rest of those 63, which is not actually benefiting that student. And so again, like I've, I see like one of the problems is that a lot of times we we will identify the problem, we'll make a plan, we'll try to do those things, we'll have those conversations, but when it comes to the work and sustaining that work, mm-hmm. um is is missing. And then also I kind of just did a, a budget presentation as well yesterday, but um one of the major themes that was coming up and we were talking about uh, mental health as well is that there's inconsistent funding and that's not just from the current generation or current uh, leaders but that's just been historically like ever since public health has been you know in like trying to be incorporated into the American system and it's just like people are constantly failing people are constantly falling through the cracks and then we'll say um even for our underserved communities it's a one size fit all solution or we can just pour money in and I'm just like no that's not that's not really the solution because yes you can have money but if that money is not utilized if we're not empowering our students and actually educating them and making things relevant and relatable and you know having them make meanings and giving them the time and opportunity to explore then we're not going to be able to have you know, more people be able to want to uh, like speak up and stand out or even um, raise our future generations so that we can continue to progress towards a more equitable 
future because like with the attack on DEI, a lot of students, a lot of students, especially of color, aren't going to continue to have those opportunities con to continue to push, push forward. And then like for me personally, I do, I kind of have like a personal feeling about it. It's just like, yes, those things were, were in place and then now there's not done. So it's like, what's really going to go on? what's really going to go on like does do I not matter anymore because like all up until this point like I kind of had you know those support those things like kind of in place safeguarding my future making sure that my education could be equitable that the opportunities that I had were equitable that I was able to play in sports that I was able to go to college fairs and things of that sort but then now even at the doctorate level so it's like okay I'll apply for a position and it's just like, okay, is it? No, D DEI is not really the thing here in Florida. So it's just like, okay, well, am I going to just get looked over because like my application is black? And so like you have a lot of different things that are in place that are compounding on each other. That's, in, that's uh, impacting the mm -hmm. way that we can be able to stand up and, and speak for ourselves. Cause like, even now, like I, again, like, with my um with pursuing a doctor of public health degree like my focus is mental health i want to give back into the community i want to do the prevention work because i have been able to recognize you know not only just from uh because like i have an undergraduate degree in psychology as well so being able to recognize and come to a, a awakening about how life has been it's just like okay well Things are going to have to change, but it's, it's at the same time we see so many things going backward. That was just I, like, yeah. first of all, I just have to give you kudos. Like you are doing the thing, girl. Like I am just really impressed with your drive, your determination. It sounds like you're really hitting the nail in a lot of places. Um, you brought up a few things that I want to be able to address. Um, well, I want to start with equity and um, the fear that I think is behind. The, the push to abandon DEI and like let's be clear this is obviously a, um, a a political motive to abandon DEI work um but there's a lot of people that just aren't having it you know big big corporations for example I've been sitting with um some corporate partners the last um few weeks and they're like we, we need this more than ever and in fact it makes us money when we as a corporate organization are willing to support our employees through employee resource groups, or we are conscientious in, in the community and in the product that we deliver and in the ways that we are hiring, that helps our bottom line. And so I, I don't think that this push against DEI is um, for everyone. I think that there's still a lot of people that are like, I don't what are you talking about? Like, of course, diversity matters. Of course, inclusion matters. Um, and so I hope that we can come back to our senses sooner than later on that. Um, but it's really about this idea of putting people into boxes. One of the, the binary conversations that I hear that comes up over and over and over again is this idea of being oppressed or being an oppressor. And that people don't want to People don't want to see themselves in either of those boxes, right? Like it, I don't want, I don't want to be either of those. And, and it's inappropriate, I think, to drill down DEI work into putting people into categories of oppressed versus oppressor. And so, you know, I think a lot about how do we as one jacks help have conversation about oppression without having people walk away as if they feel um labeled that they need to carry oppressor. Because I think that at any given time, we probably all work at, walk into spaces probably in the same day and, and assume the role of oppressed or oppressor. You know, if you're a, a, a man walking into a female space, it doesn't matter what color your skin is. There are, there are places where women want to be recognized for their femininity and men want to be recognized for their masculinity. We can talk about race. We can talk about religion. At any given time, we might fill one of those roles and we can't continue to talk about to, to reduce the subject matter to being so simple as I don't want you to look at me as if I am oppressed or you are an oppressor, because I think we all carry that 
in, in a variety of spaces where we might be. Um, and, and it is okay to acknowledge that when I am in either of those roles, that is hard. That I need to learn, I need to check myself, I need to understand uh, my own bias so that I am not oppressing people consciously or unconsciously. But I also don't wanna be in a position where people want to hold me down, period, point blank. That's not what I want in my life. Um, and I think that we need to continue to have conversations that um, elevate the idea of DEI as not putting people into categories that are fixed, that we are diverse people and that the our relationships and our identities and our the intersection of those is fluid um, and that matters. So that's part of the work that I hope we can do. You also talked about money. I, I brought this up a little bit some people understand that this is actually, um, when we talk about reconciliation and healing, there is, that's beneficial. There is cost savings to be had, especially when we look at, I see Stacey's question here, um, oh, for the Center of Civil Rights. Um, sorry, I thought that that was about, oh, Health Zone 1 is what I saw, Health Zone. I was just at a um, conference this week and we were talking about social determinants of health when we talk about the criminal justice system, when we talk about the jail system, if we were willing to, or help people articulate, maybe that's better. If we can have conversations that allow people to articulate cost savings, how this actually benefits us as a community and maybe our city government or, or larger companies and organizations, if you were actually equitable, if you are willing to be inclusive, if you are willing to sit down and confront the injustices that have you, that maybe you've allowed to be perpetuated for, I don't know, decades, centuries, um, there is value to them. And so that that matters when you're having these conversations, being able to show the value um, and what where there's gonna be a return on the investment in this process matters. Um, and then lastly, this is a really, really challenging one for us. It's one where we'll go into strategic planning this year as an organization. Um, but when you're thinking about qualitative change, that we want healing, that we want better you know, communication, more, um, more inclusive community, it's really hard to measure that. So it's really hard to, to be able to show that we're making progress. And it feels like we never are. It feels very, very difficult to measure. And when you've been doing the work for a long time, as it sounds like you have, and and you know, to some degree, I guess I've been doing it for several years now, um, it can be really discouraging. And moving the needle just a little bit doesn't feel like enough, um, but every little small step matters. And I think we need to figure out collectively how to create priorities that allow us to measure our progress in a way that's meaningful. Because otherwise it's hard to, to get the, the community, to get partners, to get people to buy in to why this matters um, and why we need to keep doing it when it feels like it's just not changing. So that makes me ask this question. Um, does One Jack have fund dedicated or um, towards research and evaluation of mm -hmm. these initiatives? I think that's um, a great idea. I was just literally this morning in a um, in a workout and a breakout session. And, and the recommendation was when you write your budget, make a line item for data collection. Make, okay. make it part of your budget that you are collecting metrics. Um, on the programs and work that you're doing. So, um, you know, we are a nonprofit as well. We we rely almost exclusively on private philanthropy to run our organization. Um, so we don't do a lot of funding other things. We're we're begging for money too, along with everyone else, the big the big donors and the foundations and and fighting for grant dollars. Um, but I'm I think that as a community as an organization that serves our community, we have to get really clear about some shared goals and figure out how to measure those goals. Because when we can tell that story of making change and, and moving the needle, if we can, and if we can't, then why the hell not? Like, let's go back and like figure out where we messed up. 
um, and try again, you know, like if it didn't work and you fell down, you better get up and do it again. That's kind of how I operate. And so um, I think no. that that's really an important piece of it. Um, and we do have to ask for grant money, ask for funding, ask for the foundations to be willing to um, help us figure out how to measure and then track the metrics. Uh, no, Excuse me. Stand Okay. Well, I'm saying it's all we, we can always talk about the darn money as if that's the only thing. And I'm, I'm appalled, appalled by that because I'm, I'm meeting all the time. I put in over 200 hours mm -hmm. every year in City Hall. It's always about the money. Mm -hmm. It's but more that is, I mean, in that. fairness, but that is the on, function. Hold on a second. Hold on a second. Hold on a second, please. Mm hmm. I'm having a park. Nonprofits are making this money. It's every time you look around, it's a different nonprofit. The city of Jacksonville is mm -hmm. introducing. Nothing changed. Y'all are spending money and and no accountability. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I can't I can't disagree with you there. That's why it's important to me that we are able to look at how to measure and make sure that we're moving the needle. Because I don't think it's enough just to say, oh, we had 95 people come to our community suppers. So, and what? What did that do for this community? Um, I think that that's really important. And it's a place where um, I don't feel comfortable taking private philanthropy dollars and, and buying people dinners and not moving the needle. Like, that's not what I'm here for. But I, I, so I don't disagree with you. Although I will say the city council and our elected bodies, like their primary job is to spend tax money. So, you know, we, that they are talking a lot about money because that is what their job is and whether or not they're doing that well is a whole other, we could have a whole other conversation about that. Yeah. Well, we definitely need to have a, I will reach out to you, have a, uh, that conversation because that's not true. And I'm a subject matter expert in the field. I'm in city hall. They're spending money, only 2% uh, of them are spending their money, the same people, the same families. And it comes to mental health, it's different from African-Americans and Caucasian. Yeah. It's not the same part of money. Thank you. No, I appreciate you bringing that up. I am. Um, I also happen to sit on the um, mental health subcommittee for for um, the mayor and um we are looking at those at those demographic data points i'd like to bring up another area uh we had a speaker a while back dr vitale who talked about policing does mm -hmm. not work he wrote a book on the subject he's a professor up north in uh in new orleans in the years 17 18 19 each year they cut the murder rate so that by the end of 2019, they have a very high rate of murder rate, much higher than Jacksonville's, which is also extremely high. But they cut it by 50%. And then it stopped. I've reached out to the former sheriff to try to find out what happened. I haven't heard back from him I don't know, as to why it stopped. But that Where was this. It was in New Orleans the, that okay. they achieved this dramatic reduction. In the year 2020, the murder rate jumped up higher than it had ever been. So obviously, they, the very effective program, it proved itself, stopped working. And I, I don't know why. But uh, if we could bring that program to Jacksonville, uh, it, it, people, the police were in the communities and knew the people and treated them as uh, people that they understood and related with, we could change the picture here, too. Only hopefully yeah, not this, for three years. And well, fortunately or unfortunately, there are there are programs that have really good data, especially when it comes to policing. Um and and criminal justice pipelines. Um we just haven't invested in them in this city. I mean, it's really kind of gross. Um Bye. Kind of gross. Would, it's really gross. I would be I would be reaching out to you. I would definitely because it's uh it's a different story because I'm in those meetings. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, one of the things that we've no hold on. 
You had uh -huh. the same people calling the shots, Democrats and Republicans. Mm -hmm. They moving money. I got the data. Yeah. No, I don't. I don't. I don't disagree that that money continues to be invested and we are not seeing results. And it's unfortunate because I do believe that there are programs in other places that have had some levels of success. Um, I know one of the conversations um, we've had in the mental health committee is some work that's happened down in um, Miami-Dade with, um, it's like diversion type programs where you have folks that, are really struggling or suffering with mental illness being put into the criminal justice system. And that's not, it's just inappropriate, right? And so how do we as a city um, implement a different pathway based on you know, people's needs and that we're not just criminalizing people for being ill. And so I, I think that there is definitely um, more conversation to be had. And in my role now at One Jack, now that I'm eight weeks in, um, I think about how do we bring these conversations to the community in a way that is palatable, um, that can in, that can bring them more people to the table so that we can have better advocates because you all meet here and you have these conversations with each other over and over and over again um not that that's you know not valuable but how do we bring new people into the conversation and get new people activated so that we can really create some movement so that you're not at city hall alone stanley having these conversations well when it comes to me uh I use technology, so I'm all around, the, not only in Jacksonville, but the country mm -hmm. and around the world uh, with technology today. So I understand what's going on here. You have a leadership problem from the top to the bottom, from the bottom to the top in Jacksonville, especially for 54 years. And I've been here. I'm a native of Jacksonville, mm -hmm. born and raised in La Villa. Um, I still live downtown Jacksonville. But my point is, uh, you got a leadership problem. And once you remove some of this money that they're stealing, then we can make some changes. And then also to the point of, thank you, Stanley, for sharing, but also to the point of like reaching out to the community in technology, like does one Jack use social media at all? Yeah, actually, that's that's um, a good question. So really just this um, this year, before I came on, maybe about six months ago, there was um, a push to re-engage or engage our community um, via social media in a way that we really had never leveraged before. Um, so we are not where I would like to be, um, but we are trying. <laughs> you can go to our, you know, OneJax on any of our platforms. Um, and see, there was just a post today, but we we are trying to um, find new ways to engage. We're going to look at um, whether or not we might be able to bring that Brown versus Board conversation, um, you know, live stream be recorded and have opportunity to engage people via social media as well. Because I do think that there are, you know, in an effort to be inclusive, not everybody can get to the Jesse in the 75 seats that we're going to have available. Um, you know, we want to make sure that people are, are um, afforded the opportunity to hear conversations. Well, we can move the needle forward if we have the conversation, uh, like you say, with the technology, because we use it all the time around the, around the country. So uh, we shouldn't have no problems, but they need to be at the 6 p.m. Uh, because if you want people to be civic engaged uh, on the local level, you have to do it that's convenient for them. And a lot of time downtown Jacksonville, DIA, all of them, because I'm in all of them uh, different meetings, uh, they're doing it on their time. That's a problem. That's a mental health problem right there. Thank you. I understand that. Listen, I, I, I would say that my staff and the people that work for me probably want some time home with their families too. Um, but I, when we do bring community events, we do try to make sure that those are in the evening. Um, I'm not in an elected role anymore, but when I was there, believe me, I understood we had a lot of work that was happening during the day and people complained all the time. We can't get to these meetings. So I get it. It's hard to find a balance between working and having staff that, that do this as their job 
and also want to engage with their families or the community and then being present for the community, right? There's, there's just, we got to find balance. No, uh, basically all you need is a line where people can call in and leave messages and make it a one minute or either two minutes. If so, they have any comments concerning one Jack's that's easy. That yeah, I mean, you can call our number anytime. Right. Yeah. That's 24 seven. I deal with technology. So it's a whole different world out here, especially when it, I hate to say, uh, uh, when it comes to African American, all is not the same. And some of us are doing pretty good in life and, and are shot callers. And, and I seem to have a problem no matter whenever I have a conversation in Jacksonville, they think we all the same. We are mm -hmm. not monolithic people. That's right. Yeah, that's a mental health problem. I would definitely agree with that. Uh, but I did want to let everyone know that we have a few minutes left on. So if anybody wanted to make sure that um, everyone had a chance to speak. So if there's anyone we haven't heard from that would like to contribute to the conversation, conversation, please, please feel free um, to do so. I just wanted to make sure that, I mean, if anybody can break in if you want to, but I did see your um, comment or question in the chat, Stacey. Um, how can other organizations partner with our organization for future projects? Um, that, that I am having those conversations right now. So please feel free to reach out to me. It's elizabeth at onejacks.org is, um, is my email. I can put that in the chat for us. Um, but this is what we are going into strategic planning with my with my board. Um, and so really being able to take this time, hear from people, find out how we can engage, what projects our voice um, can help move forward um, and our networks can help move forward and, and how we need to be investing our time strategically um, over the next few years is that is right where I'm living right now. So if you have thoughts, um, please feel free to reach out. I will say I was just with Myra Martello this week um, talking a lot about the Center for Children's Rights and, and I'm a big fan of the work that they do. You did a great job. You're doing a great job. You're doing a great job. You're on the right track. Uh, you need some help. Uh, now I can help you on, on, uh, with the African-American Economic Recovery Think Tank. Uh, our you. work is out here. Um, but I like to say this here, a lot of issues that's taking a lot of pathology taking place in the African American community is self inflicted. And I want to put that on the table. And I'm an African American. So I'm hold, holding my community responsible also as African American. Thank you for being such a good advocate, Stanley. Thank you guys for hosting these conversations and just being really diligent um, with offering opportunities for folks to come together. Um, I'm grateful for the invitation. I wasn't able to join you all in, in March because um, we had a community supper, but um, you know, I would love to be able to share the work that One Jacks is doing. And um, hopefully uh, you would be willing to bring your faces and voices and perspectives to our, um, to our meetings because um, you know, it matters. It matters to have a wide variety of um, perspectives at the table. Did you want to share One Jack's site with the last couple of minutes left? One Jack's what? Website. I sure will. Yeah. Um, I will put it. Look, I'm going to put it in the chat. Yeah, we got to bring you up to speed on technology because you you seem like you're a little late. <laughs> and here is our website. Pay. Yes. Yeah, post whatever you want to post. I mean, it's legal. <laughs> Don't get me in trouble, Stanley. All yeah. right, here's um, here's our website. Um, our tagline here is um, different together, and this is our this is the work that we do promoting respect and understanding among people of difference, uh, faith, races, sexual orientations, and other dimensions of identity. So this is the work that we are committed to. We have a variety of programs. Um, Interfaith is one pillar of the work that we do. Our youth programs. If you have any young people, middle or high school aged, um, or you want to work or volunteer with us this summer, we run camps. Um, we'll have several programs for KJ youth and then we'll run Metro Town camps um, this summer as well. So you can see our youth programming. Um, youth programs have really taken a hit 
um, with the with DEI being pushed out of our K-12 classrooms. And so we know that we need to be really intentional about, about reaching out to our young people. Um, and then we have our humanitarian awards event coming up and that will be um, in May. This is a very fancy event um, and has been, a, a, here you go, each year since 1970 um, has been a part of the work we do in the community recognizing humanitarians around Jacksonville. These are um, our honorees this year. You will notice um, that um, it's not as diverse as I would like, um, but I was on a part of the selection committee that last year. So um, although I'm really excited, these are really phenomenal leaders um, for our community. They're very deserving individuals and we are excited to recognize them as honorees. Well, thank you so much for sharing your site. You are so welcome. Feel free to hop um, over, follow us on social media, check out, a, check out our website, um, or reach out to me, Elizabeth at onejacks.org. I am happy um, to continue to build these relationships. And again, I'm new to this, so. Um, you did a great job. I appreciate you all. No, great job. And, Thanks, Stanley. Hi, Ms. Anderson. Yes. Hi, this is Richard Dan for over the Urban League. I Hi. wanted to. I, I wanted to chat in and just say thank you so very much for joining us. And we we uh, uh, we certainly uh, support One Jacks. Uh, we feel that we are a partner with you guys, and uh, so anything we can do um, to help in that regard, uh, you know, please reach out. So, but again, thank you all for participation, and. Uh, I see you, Stanley. Um, yep. yep. Hello. Hello. I think his hand, you, Stanley, your hand has been up for a little while. But did you have a new question? My hand's always up. I, well, <laughs> that's what I thought. That's that's what I was thinking. <laughs> Thank you so much for your kind words, Richard. And of course, um, you know, we are happy to partner with the Urban League. And in fact, as I'm thinking about it now, we should probably maybe look at how we can do a specific, you know, partnership on a community supper. Um, absolutely, absolutely. Yes. All right, and I'll just come in for the final close. Thank you everyone for attending. A special thank you to our guest speaker, Elizabeth Anderson of the One Jacks. Um, be sure to tune in, log back in for our next racial healing and reconciliation talk next month. This one will be posted to our YouTube and I hope everyone have a great evening again. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, Dr. Stacey. Have a good night. Good night. Thank you so much. You did such a good job. You did. Uh, thank you so much. Are you going to be around Jacksonville this summer? I am. Are you working? So right now, the only work that I'm doing is with... Uh, it's just us. Okay. I think it's just us. Wait, 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 wait. I have to stop recording. <laughs>